While the ATF recently announced that it's now okay to shoulder a pistol with a brace installed, at least in certain circumstances, some guns are just meant to be converted into a short-barreled rifle. The problem is, doing so requires months of waiting and a $200 tax stamp. In addition to that, not every design works well as an SBR. But because reviews on NFA restricted guns are relatively uncommon, it's tough to figure out what would and wouldn't make a quality SBR and why. Now part of getting that information correct is understanding not only the purpose of cutting down a design, but also establishing metrics of success influenced by shortening the gun. That way you're not deciding what's a good gun, but rather what's a good candidate to make an SBR. So, after firing dozens of NFA restricted firearms, I've come up with my top five SBRs based on the following five categories. First is reliability. Does cutting down the design make it unreliable? Second is terminal ballistics. Does reducing the length dramatically affect the projectile's effectiveness? Third is balance slash ergonomics. Does reducing the overall length improve the design's balance or ergonomics, or does it hinder them? And the fourth being the X factor, so to speak. Now, this is what separates this design from other designs. So in, in this case, it's a roller delayed gun, but what does that actually mean? Now we'll go into that for each design. Now, lastly, to prevent this from being a full on fluff piece for the industry, I'm gonna throw in my fifth contributing factor that I'm gonna call the limiting factor. It's what holds that design or gun back from being the perfect SBR. Now, with that in mind, here are my top five firearms to convert into an SBR. H&K's world-renowned roller-delayed firearms are impressive for reasons outside of the lauded HK slap. They are some of the most reliable, durable firearms on the planet. And of all the roller-delayed guns Heckler & Koch has built, none has been fielded by more police and military units than their 9mm subgun, the MP5. Thankfully, reliability as an SBR is not an issue with the MP5. This is because the gun was designed from inception to function reliably with an 8.9 inch barrel. Additionally, because the MP5 functions via roller delayed blowback, changing the barrel length doesn't significantly affect how the system cycles. What about terminal ballistics? Well, chambered in 9mm parabellum, which is clearly a pistol cartridge, the MP5's caliber of choice is designed for use in shorter barrels. This makes most defensive ammunition, which is designed to function in these shorter pistol barrels, equally as effective, if not more effective, in the slightly elongated MP5's SBR barrel. In terms of ergonomics and balance, when the MP5 is in either a pistol or an SBR configuration, they are excellent, with the majority of the weight just forward of the magazine well. This provides a solid balance of comfort and recoil reduction. Ergonomics are a different story, and they vary from great to okay. If the MP5 is set up with a fixed stock and a paddle release for magazines, the ergonomics are excellent. The fire control selector switch is easy to reach, and ambidextrous versions of the selector exist for southpaw shooters. Collapsible stocks are available, and while they make the gun more compact, they're also not terribly comfortable, especially when using an optic. But what separates the roller delayed MP5 from competing designs, like direct blowback pistol caliber carbines, is twofold. It's felt recoil and reliability. Most pistol caliber carbines are substantially heavier than the MP5 and have drastically more felt recoil, even when chambered in the same caliber. And like the direct blowback designs it seeks to supplant, the MP5 still has stellar reliability. And what about the limiting factor? Well, what holds the gun back is the cost of ownership. The guns themselves are prohibitively expensive and their accessories equally so. The Tactical collapsible stock runs north of $250 and optic mounts cost more than 100 bucks. But if a shooter can spare the cash, the MP5 makes a great choice for an SBR. All right, what looks like a blaster rifle crossed with a Game Boy and fires potent 10 millimeter rounds without much recoil? The 10 millimeter Chris Vector. Now, like the MP5, the Vector doesn't rely on a gas system to cycle. But unlike the MP5, the Vector uses the Super V recoil mitigation system instead of roller delayed. This is basically a fancy method of delayed blowback. And what it means in terms of reliability is reducing the barrel length doesn't have a dramatic effect on reliability. 
Now in terms of terminal ballistics, the 10 millimeter auto cartridge is a seriously powerful round originally envisioned by the late great Colonel Jeff Cooper as a way of launching 200 grain projectiles at a blistering 1200 feet per second. As such, it offers magnum like performance in a semi-automatic friendly configuration. And since the 10 millimeter round was designed for use in both pistols and submachine guns, the Vector's five and a half inch barrel achieves excellent ballistic performance from it. In terms of balance, the Vector's special recoil mitigation system necessitates that the carbine be nose heavy. This is because the mechanism of operation resides in the front of the gun. The carbine version of the Vector compounds this issue by adding additional forward weight in the form of more barrel. As such, running the pistol length 5.5 inch barrel with a shoulder stock results in a hefty but well balanced carbine. As for ergonomics, they remain unchanged going from carbine to SBR and improve upon the pistols with the addition of a shoulder stock. Simply put, it's easier to quickly shoulder, engage, and identify targets when you can rest the stock legally against your shoulder. Now what separates the Vector from other carbines is the hard hitting nature of its 10 millimeter auto round combined with a soft shooting recoil mitigation system. This combination makes the gun suitable for home defense against two-legged aggressors and four-legged ones alike. In fact, with the proper loading, the 10 millimeter Vector could effectively stop even medium-sized bears in North America. So what's holding it back? Well, everything sounds great, right? There's only one catch, capacity. As of now, the largest magazines available for the Vector hold only 15 rounds of 10 millimeter auto. This is because the 10 millimeter Vector, like the 9 millimeter and 45 ACP versions, feeds from Glock magazines. And currently there's no such thing as an extended, reliable Glock 20 magazine. Now, magazine extension plates do exist, but they only raise the capacity by four rounds at most. Basically, the Vector is a great choice if a shooter wants power without the over-penetration or recoil of a rifle round while having access to excellent defensive loads suitable for stopping anything in North America short of a charging moose. Finally, a firearm chambered in an actual rifle round. The 7.62x39 Draco is the civilian legal pistol version of the Romanian PM Model 90 submachine gun. In the West, we would call this thing a carbine because it's not chambered in a pistol caliber, but it's essentially a very short AK. Now, while the military version ships from the factory with a side folding wire stock, the pistol versions imported into the US lack a proper rear trunnion and thus need to be modified to accommodate a stock. Now, the Draco is a long stroke, piston driven semi automatic firearm. This means reducing the barrel length, increases gas pressure, cycling speed, and thus reliability. Thankfully, the Draco ships with a gas system specifically tuned to its 11 and a half inch barrel. So its reliability and function are unchanged. Also, attempting to cut the barrel's length any further is pointless since the gun's gas tube is nearly as long as the barrel itself, and cutting that would turn the gun quickly into a single shot rifle. What about terminal ballistics? Well, after chronographing a half dozen of my favorite 7.62 by 39 millimeter loads, including offerings from Hornady, Silver Bear, Tula, Golden Tiger, and Wolf, the Draco's 11.5 inch barrel on average only reduces muzzle velocity by 7.9% compared to a standard AKM's 16 inch barrel. While this loss of velocity will certainly reduce effective range, both full metal jacket and expanding bullets should still perform as intended out to 200 yards, well beyond the reach of most shooters with this short sight radius. While the Draco pistol is a ton of fun to shoot without a stock, the addition of one actually makes hitting your target a lot more likely. As for ergonomics, they're what you expect from an AK. Not as high speed, low drag as an AR-15, but very serviceable with a little practice. Now what about X Factor? The Draco brings the legendary reliability and durability of the AKM to a handy lightweight package. It also uses the same inexpensive, ultra durable die hard magazines as the AK-47. So what holds back the Romanian fire breather from perfection? Well, for starters, that fire. The muzzle blast on the end of the Draco is like a flashbang going off with every single trigger pull. True, it can be mitigated or even overlooked with a sound suppressor or a decent conical flash hider. It's still fairly annoying and makes the gun less than ideal for use in low or no light settings. But what really holds the gun back is its lack of an optics rail. No, not a rail dust cover, but a side rail like the standard Romanian SAR carbine. The gun's super short sight radius 
and user-unfriendly post and notch sites makes hitting distant targets very, very challenging for all but the most accomplished marksmen. While railed handguards topped with reflex sights make for faster shooting at close range, the addition of even a two times magnification optic would greatly increase the practical accuracy of the Draco. Overall, if you want a die-hard reliable mini carbine or simply one of the most fun blasters you can take to the range, the Draco is your weapon of choice. Admittedly, I'm showing my bias here. The MPX is one of my all-time favorite guns and the first I ever went to the trouble of SBRing. That said, the MPX is one of the softest shooting 9mm carbines I've ever run, and one that really shines in an SBR configuration. The SIG MPX is a 9mm, short-stroke, piston-driven firearm that feeds from Lancer-made polymer magazines. Unlike most piston-driven firearms, the MPX's piston is self-regulating. This means reducing the barrel length does not affect reliability. Another boon is that if you wish to swap barrels, it only requires an Allen key and a few hundred bucks sent to SIG. Just like the MP5 chambered in the same caliber, the MPX also squeezes great performance from its 9mm cartridge. Also like the MP5, the MPX's extended barrel helps stretch the legs of the limited effective range of the 9mm Parabellum cartridge. Meaning, your favorite Hornady tap ammo will hit just a little bit harder at close range. In terms of balance and ergonomics, the MPX in a pistol configuration is pretty damn unwieldy and is overly heavy when set up as a carbine with a 16 inch barrel. As an SBR though, the MPX comes into its own with superb handling characteristics that make for a very quick shooting carbine with a nice centralized point of balance. As for ergonomics, the fire controls are easy to reach regardless of how the gun is set up and the available stock options range from awkward wire stock to near perfect with the Lage side folder, plus that same company, Lage, makes an M4 style collapsible stock adapter, so you can run pretty much any stock you want on the gun. Now the MPX's X factor is its combination of modularity and incredibly soft recoil. The MPX uses AR-15 pistol grips and triggers, and with an adapter can even use the AR-15 stock. This, combined with its self-regulating piston system, results in a carbine that kicks like a Red Rider on steroids, but still delivers 9mm slugs with potent accuracy. Now what holds the gun back, in my opinion, is its 13.5mm left-handed thread pitch. I mean, because screw anybody who wants to use an existing 9mm comp or sound suppressor on their brand new carbine. This, and SIG's decision to remove the adjustable gas block from production guns. Because of this, the MPX suffers from blowback when ran with a 9mm suppressor. Utilizing a larger caliber can reduces this blowback, but an adjustable gas valve would have elevated the MPX from near perfect to godlike status. Overall, if you want the softest shooting 9mm carbine on the market, the MPX is your gun. Lightweight, accurate, soft shooting, modular, and affordable, the AR-15 is currently one of the best deals in the gun industry. Naturally, this makes it an ideal candidate for an SBR. Or does it? Of all the guns on the list, the AR-15 is probably the most susceptible to drastic changes in reliability relating to the length of the gun's barrel. That is, of course, assuming the AR-15 in question is set up for direct impingement and not reconfigured for either piston-driven operation or manually operated. Full-length 20-inch barrels require a different gas system and different buffer tube than carbine systems, while confusing the shooter is still able to make the gun reliable regardless of its configuration. As far as ballistic effectiveness, the AR-15 is both the best and the worst performer on the list. This is because an AR-15 can be found chambered in nearly every modern cartridge. Its most common round, the 55 grain 556 by 45 millimeter cartridge, has honestly lackluster terminal ballistics when launched from a short barrel. On the other hand, SBR friendly chamberings like 300 Blackout perform much better in shorter, more compact barrel lengths. Just like reliability, terminal ballistics basically relates to it depends, meaning it depends on how the gun is configured. What about balance and ergonomics? While well, the AR-15 is amazingly lightweight in its original M16A1 configuration, and even when decked out with bulky, all-steel railed handguards, is still manageable. Balance largely depends on configuration, though in general, M4-style setups are drastically better balanced with a 10.5-inch barrel than a 16-inch NFA-compliant one. As far as ergonomics are concerned, I personally feel the AR-15 is the current gold standard. Every critical control can be actuated without shifting the firing grip. This permits the shooter to stay on the gun while reloading, chambering around, or simply flipping the safety lever to the off position. The only aspect of its design that I would change is the charging latch. 
is a little too small and it requires the shooter to reach over and in front of the sights to actually use. That said, there are dozens of oversized aftermarket options for it and even side chargers. So again, it depends on the configuration. What's the X factor? Well, if it isn't glaringly obvious yet, the aspect of the AR-15 that makes it truly unique is its modularity. Shooters can configure their SBR AR-15 into dozens of calibers in thousands of configurations. Whether that's a pump action 300 blackout rifle with a 24 inch barrel, a four inch nine millimeter pistol caliber carbine-esque PDW, or an eight inch barreled 762 by 39 mid-sized carbine, the AR-15 can be anything you want it to be, and then some. So what holds back the world's most modular firearm from perfection? The buffer tube, or rather the gun's reliance on it. Because most AR-15 variants require the buffer tube or receiver extension's buffer spring to function, the AR-15 can only get so small. Yes, side folding stocks do exist for it, but for the most part, most ARs have to have that stock attached, which unfortunately overall limits just how small a shooter can make their SBR to AR-15. Look, going to the trouble of paying a overpriced 200 bucks for a tax stamp is undeniably annoying, but the resulting ultra handy carbine can be worth the hassle. Provided, of course, that the gun the shooter decides to modify is one that will be enhanced by being shortened and not hindered by it. Now, while all the guns we saw in this video are excellent SBR candidates, they are by no means the only ones you should consider. Truthfully, any design that meets the criteria listed before should make a viable candidate to convert into a short-barreled rifle. Ultimately, a shooter should just determine whether or not the gun gains any true benefits from being converted. And if not, consider something else, unless you just want something to play with at the range. Lastly, if you intend to use any of these firearms for home defense, self-defense, or any serious work, be sure that the gun runs flawlessly with the ammunition you decide to run in it before committing it to any serious types of work. Thanks guys. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more burst reviews.